Good morning. It's 10 o'clock. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, Ding Darling Wildlife Society's lecture series. This is the last of the season of lectures and what a wonderful lecture to end on with Stan Tequila. Thank you to many of you. I see a lot of the same faces that come every week and almost every week. I think we've had them sporadically. It's not every Friday. But thank you for caring. Thank you for being interested. We're always out there. There's always something new to learn, and uh, you are here to learn new things today, and thanks for being a part of this series. My name is Bergie Miller. I am the executive director of the Ding Darling Wildlife Society, which is the nonprofit arm of the refuge. And uh, the refuge couldn't do much of what it does without support from the Friends Group. And rather than me go into great detail, we have a phenomenal video that will tell you a little bit about who we are. And I know many of you have seen it. You could probably recite the whole thing as you're watching it, but that's okay. I'm gonna remind you of all the good things that the society is doing to help the refuge and future generations. So I'll have April start that up. Wildlife Refuge of today isn't here by chance. In the early 1940s, J. Norwood Darling, for whom the refuge is now named, was instrumental in the effort to block the sale of environmentally valuable land to developers. Ultimately, at his urging, President Harry S. Truman signed an executive order creating this refuge in 1945. In 1982, the Ding Darling Wildlife Society Friends of the Refuge began. Its purpose was to educate visitors about the importance of protecting lands, waters, and wildlife. In 1999, this group of volunteers stepped up to lead the building of the Refuge's Visitor and Education Center. This was the first partnership of its kind, where a friends group raised money to construct a federal building. And it is still the hub of the Refuge today. Why was this necessary? And what is the Society's role today? Well, over the decades, the refuge budget has been cut 60%, and it has half the staff it formerly did. Meanwhile, visitors have increased 66% to nearly 1 million people annually. The refuge cannot meet their growing needs alone. So the Ding Darling Wildlife Society works to fill in the gaps where federal funding falls short. Most importantly, the refuge keeps Ding Darling spirit alive by educating generation after generation about the importance of conservation. So visitors from around the world will take that knowledge back to the communities where they live. Today, with the help of generous donors, the society supports the refuge in these primary areas. Land acquisition and restoration. Advocacy. Conservation education wildlife protection, biology and water quality research, and internships. What really draws people to Sanibel and the core objective of people is to come and enjoy the JN Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. I think Ding Darling would, would just be ecstatic over the fact that, that there are people that are carrying on his legacy. I mean, he obviously gave from his pocketbook, gave from his heart, but he would be ever so gratified to know that that legacy that he started continues today. The best legacies are not what you do for yourself today, but what you do for the next generation. I wanted to be at the refuge because there were things that I could do here. Every time I come to volunteer, I see the important work of, of that's being done by the Ding Darling Wildlife Society. I see the smile on children's faces and families who are enjoying nature and wildlife. It is so wonderful, it really is, to know that all of this work will be protected for the next generation 
because of the work that the society has accomplished. Because if we don't do it, who will? Who will do it? To that end, the Dean Darling Wildlife Society is dedicated to ensuring that Dean's legacy lives on at the JN Dean Darling National Wildlife Refuge. We invite you to join us and our thousands of members in supporting the refuge for generations to come. So that is who we are, and without members, uh, this refuge would be a very different place. This island would be a very different place. Ding Darling, if he hadn't cared like all of you care, the refuge wouldn't even be there today. And uh, we work uh, with everybody um, and generations like him who care to make that difference. And thanks for being here and caring. If you're not a member, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, but we love seeing you at the refuge as well. So thanks for that. Shopping uh, also supports the refuge. We have tables out there, but we have a store just across the street now and also at the refuge and proceeds from all of the, the sales from our nature stores go to support the mission as well. But philanthropy is what makes things happen. It's what helps us help the refuge. This lecture series would not be happening without supporters. And I'd like to say a special thanks to our sponsors for this lecture, Vortex Optics. I see a lot of people using those opticals uh, out at the refuge and beyond a fellow Minnesotan, and the Jenny and Kyle Foundation. So again, thank you so much to our sponsors. This lecture series, like I said, throughout the season would not be happening without philanthropy and bringing people like Stan Tequila and so many other speakers for all of us to enjoy and learn from. But Stan Tequila, he loves Sanibel. He has a history here that I didn't even know about. Uh, he is an author, naturalist, wildlife photographer, and the originator of the popular state-specific field guide series and many to use identification guides for the US. Over the last 30 years, he has authored nearly 200 field guides, quick guides, nature books, children's books, wildlife audio CDs, puzzles, and uh, playing cards, presenting many species of birds, mammal, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, just trying to get people to see and understand the beauty of nature and wildlife found across the U.S. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Natural History from the University of Minnesota and is an active professional naturalist for more than 35 years. He studies and photographs wildlife throughout the U.S. and has received various national and regional awards for his books and photographs. One of his more in-depth books, which is available for sale outside, uh, is Bird Nests, amazingly ingenious and intricate, brings insight to the most amazing dwelling spaces in the entire animal kingdom. Few creatures craft such brilliant and involved homes as birds. It is filled with unparalleled photography and promises to delight as it walks you through the world of bird nests. So please join me in welcoming Stan Tequila. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see everybody. Oh, this is great. Um, a little odd being up this high, though, but uh, it's okay. Um, so thanks for that great introduction. There was the word naturalist in that introduction at least five, six times. What's a naturalist? Nobody. <laughs> Let me remind you, if you suddenly envision somebody running through the woods naked, that's a naturist. Not a naturalist. Yeah, I'm sorry. But a naturalist is an educator, an educator about the great big world around us. It may be about the birds, plants, the bugs, rocks, doesn't matter. It's about understanding the natural world. And I educate through a variety of different ways. Um, I know that introduction is a little long, but I want to tell you a few more things that I do too. Uh, I write a syndicated newspaper column. Um, it goes across about nine states, has about three quarters of a million readers. Um, and I've been writing this newspaper column for about 25 years. It's like having a term paper due every two weeks. It's awful. It's just terrible. <laughs> And then, you know, and then you gotta come up with a new subject and all that stuff, anyhow. I also have a syndicated radio show that I do. It's great, because I'm on a hunting and fishing show. I don't hunt or fish. It's great. And all I do is poke fun at these guys who are out there, you know, shooting at things and fishing, and they don't know anything with their, what they're talking about. 
and um, I am the director of uh, Nature Center in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And uh, so every day, deal with educating the public, whether it be school kids, because during the school year we have about 2,000 school kids that come, and so we're dealing with uh, uh, small children, and we have a preschool, so those are my favorite, you know, the three, four, five-year-olds, because I can just really stir them up. And my naturalists hate me for it, because I get in there and mess up the whole program when they're in the middle of doing things. So uh, I'm also a wildlife photographer, too. You, hopefully you got to see a few uh, of my pictures. But uh, the way I mainly educate is through books. So um, about 35, 35, 36 years ago, um, I had an opportunity to write my very first book. Uh, even as a kid, I wanted to write nature books. I think that's pretty weird. You know, even as a teenager, I thought, oh, I, I want to write these nature books, you know. And uh, I would take pictures, and I would glue the pictures into a book, and then long write out all the, you know, everything I wanted to do. And I thought this was great, but I thought that would be, you know, an unachievable goal. But uh, like you said, about 35, 36 years ago, I, um, I had written a book for myself, and I got hooked up with a publisher, Adventure Publications out of uh, Cambridge, Minnesota, who was just starting out, and they took a chance on me and took me on as one of their very first authors. And I got to see my lifelong dream of writing this book uh, come true. It was absolutely amazing. And then nobody said, stop. So I kept going. I thought, well, if they're not going to say anything, I won't say anything. So I just kept writing more books and kept going and kept going. And then 36 years later, I'm just over 200 books right now. So, and and still nobody said stop. So I figured, well, I better keep going. You know, I'm like that. Oh, well, thank you. So one of the books is, uh, of course, uh, Bird Nests. I find all aspects of nature amazing. I don't care what part of it is. And I, there's nothing. You know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, I hate this or I hate that. When it comes to the wildlife, when it comes to nature, there's nothing I don't like, except for mosquitoes and ticks, but that's about it. Um, but I really enjoy that, and I find things, I find amazing wonder in a lot of things like bird nests, uh, like that. And so let's do some housekeeping to start out with here, nests and eggs and permits. So owning a bird nest, eggs, feathers, requires special federal, state and sometimes even local permits. Now, I know because you're interested in birds, there are some of you who have a small collection of feathers at home, don't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> you find that errant feather in your yard, you put it together, you, know, you put them in a little bouquet or whatever, you display them somewhere. Am I not right? Yes, you are all felons. <laughs> Every one of you, horrible people, um, but uh, I'm just all kidding aside, they, uh, they do require permits for these things. Don't worry about it. Um, it's only people like me that they would go after. You know, if I didn't have permits, oh my gosh, I would be, I'd be hung up, you know, uh, but don't worry about it. Besides, when, they, when the feather police show up at your house and they put those feather handcuffs on you and call you up and ask, don't worry about it. So, but you have to have these permits. I have these permits uh, personally and also, uh-oh. I'm like the, the, the stage police. You're covering the screen for her in the back. So you she says I'm covering the screen. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Sorry, All right, I'm gonna pace. I'm gonna walk back up and down. I need maybe down there in the audience, so be careful. You're all forewarned. So, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I know why. It's because I was blocking her view. <laughs> oh, that's fine. All right, so enough about the permits. Let's move on. So uh, nests, nests are absolutely fascinating. Um, they're, they're one of those things that um, occurs all the time. Perhaps we see them all the time, but we really don't give them second thought, do we? We don't give any thought to how or why or the intricacies of it or all that stuff. So. In evolutionary history is uh, as complicated as the birds themselves, the nests are. They really are unique. Uh, they could be anywhere from a little scrape on the ground, my pointer here to work, to these complicated uh, kind of adobe styled uh, 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 nests there, to cavities in trees, to uh, tightly woven pendulous nests. There's all sorts of different things with them. In most cases, nests are, are not used as permanent homes. 
And if I get anything across to you today, that would be that a nest is really a temporary structure that is rarely used by um, the occupants for longer than the breeding time. So you and I, every night, we go home to our homes, right? And, and you know, we have a residence there. That's not a nest. There are a few exceptions to this. There's a few species, we'll talk about those that will continue to come back to them. But in general, your robin, your blue jay, your normal birds, uh, they build a nest for one-time use to lay their eggs, raise their young, and then they're done with it. So it's a temporary structure like that. So, and they provide the shelter and the environment for, for the birds. So, um, you need the right place. When we think about nesting, we need the right place for it. So predators uh, are a problem for a lot of them. So like this, you see the little morning dove down in here, hidden away, it's, it, concealment is a big part of our, of our nest too. You gotta think about sun versus shade. Do you wanna be sitting out in the sun? Can, you know, are you the species that can handle the sun or not? And then uh, weather is, of course, a big factor in these things too. Strong winds, heavy rains, hail. Do you know anything about morning doves, by the way? This is kind of off the track a little bit. Do you know anything about morning doves and strong wind? Has anybody ever seen a morning dove nest? It's like 12 sticks put together, and then they balance an egg on top. It's ridiculous. It's like, how do you survive as a species, you know? Because you can go, and the whole nest is about to fall down, you know? It's just ridiculous. I had one in my yard last summer. I had a, a, a bark, a piece of bark at a dead tree, and the bark fell and landed on some grapevine. Morning to the nest like that. It's like, I just want to sit them down and talk to them and go, come on, man. So, anyhow, nest sizes are really directly in proportion to the size of the bird. So we have tiny little nests uh, for our hummingbirds. That's, of course, a dime, and then um, uh, two eggs in there. And uh, there are some species who will reuse nests over and over again, build onto them, add to them, remodel, update, all that stuff. And then there's others that don't, like the hummingbirds. They'll use their, the nest one time, done, finished. So uh, there's all sorts of different things you can do uh, or we can look at with this too. Ospreys, are there, are there any ospreys around here? <laughs> <laughs> Last, uh, two weeks ago, I was here with a, uh, I was here in Santa Bell with a group of, uh, I was leading a photo tour, a group of Europeans had seven people from the UK, and they'd never even been to Florida before. So I'm taking, I'm taking them around, and they just kept looking at the ospreys everywhere, just going, they're everywhere. Because <laughs> they have, they're just reintroducing them now to the UK. So they're getting a few there, just a few. And here they're like, I swear, at any given moment, you can look up in the sky here, and you can see an osprey. You know, they're just everywhere, so. But we've got all sorts of nests that kind of come along with it. When they reintroduce these species, they're reintroduced usually on a, a man-made platform, like a post with a nest on top of it. Now, of course, they've now gone back to their natural behaviors and are nesting in, uh, in trees and things like that, or on power poles or cell towers, things like that. Anyhow, but these nests can get, uh, like bald eagles can get up to 10 feet uh, wide and 20 feet thick way up to a couple of tons, too. So there's all sorts of things when you consider the, the sizes of them, but then you gotta talk about the, the material that goes into it. And the materials are very interesting uh, choices for these birds, because we see, uh, has anybody ever seen, speaking of ospreys or bald eagles, anybody ever see an osprey or bald eagle um, adding sticks to a nest? Yeah, what do they do? Find a dead tree, got all these dead branches sitting in the air, right? And they fly up to it, they grab that branch, and then they just start flapping like crazy, and they snap off the branch, you know, and then they fly back with it. It's absolutely amazing to watch. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, and then you got others that will bring in things like uh, sprigs of uh, branches of different species of trees, too, like the red-shouldered hawk bringing in some oak leaves here. So there's lots of different things going on with it. When we and the birds are, the species of the bird really dictates what kind of plant material they use. For example, black-capped chickadees uh, here are always using a very soft, fine plant material with a fur lining to the nest. How nice is that, huh? <laughs> I assume most of you are heading north here soon, right? Um, so you have, a lot of you probably have chickadees, so hopefully I'm talking about species that you're you know, quite familiar with, right? So it, it, when you go and you see these nests, they are just, they're unique, and they almost always have green moss 
in them. So they'll collect up this green moss and they'll put that green moss in their nest and they can build it that way. So he has no about tree swallows, nesting tree swallows. So the tree swallows are interesting. They'll do an all uh, kind of a dry grass nest, but then they'll bring in all these feathers to line the nest with. And we always say that um, the more feathers, the more successful they are. And everybody tries to make a correlation to the amount of feathers to the success. But you, you, you almost always get it wrong when you say, well, more feathers means the young are gonna do better, when in fact, the more feathers means you got better parents who, go, who were more successful at going out and picking up these feathers and bringing them back. So the presence or absence of these feathers in the nest really doesn't have any um, a sway as to the viability of the young, it is really truly a reflection of how good the parents are at being able to go out and find these feathers, which correlates to how much food they can find also and bring it in. So we have to look at these things a little differently. You have to kind of start to think like a naturalist, you know, uh, because one of the things that we do, so I'm a wildlife biologist by training, I spent my whole career doing, you know, environmental education and things. And one of the things I've found is that people tend to use their own human experience and they project it onto the birds. You know, well, I think this, so therefore it's that. And almost always you're wrong in those situations. And as a wildlife biologist, I sit there and kind of go, uh, no, let's, <laughs> we have to think about it a different way. And that's a good example of it right here with the amount of feathers in there. So um, I like, uh, uh, you know, wrens oftentimes line their chambers with fine roots, with rootlets and uh, blades of grass too, kind of neat. And then of course, here's your tree swallow. Do we know which one's the male and which one's the female? Yeah. Never mind, no, no, move on. Okay. All right, so these are fun. The cliff swallows make amazingly intricate nests. So you've got, I mean, there's a good juxtaposition for you, right? Morning doves, 12 sticks, and they throw it together and they balance an egg on it. These guys, look what they do. You know, the cliff swallows, they, they take this and they glue it all together, these, these dabs of mud, to make these really intricate nests. Uh, so cliff swallows, um, uh, make thousands of trips from local mud holes uh, for about two weeks to finish the nest. A lot of effort goes into that. Um, and, and that's what they've evolved to doing. That's how they've become a successful species. This is very important, you know. So there's a lot of fun things to, to kind of go on with here too. Um, some research shows that additional green plants are carefully placed in selected nests as a chemical uh, uh, deterrent for, extra, for um, uh, you know, insects that kind of will feed on the blood of the young birds in the nest. Um, I, have, I told you I'm the director of a nature center. We have over 100 uh, bluebird boxes and, uh, that we monitor. And so I have a couple of uh, volunteers who go out and monitor these nests. And a big part of what we do is making sure they're not getting infested with blowfly and all the other insects that can uh, you know, get into these uh, boxes. And so we use like a little, uh, we clean out the boxes and we use a little uh, vanilla to help deter uh, those insects where here some birds are using different plants to be able to do that too. So ingenious, right? All right, so nests and a variety of designs. Today, all the nests are results of over a million years of evolution beginning from a simple scrape nest in the dirt. So when we talk about birds, they are birds. The birds that we see around us, these are what we consider modern birds, right? And most of these birds are anywhere from three to about nine million years old, the species. Three to nine million years. So cranes, for example, sandhill cranes, we got fossilized evidence going back nine million years. Who here remembers back nine million years? Come on, somebody. Anybody? Nobody? All right. I mean, it's really when we think about this stuff and the amount of time that you and I as people interacting with birds is a very, very short period of time in comparison to a lot, a lot of these birds. Some of our other birds have only been around anywhere from two and a half to three million years that they've been around. And they've had a lot of time, you know, uh, to refine their nest making materials and how they do things. So that's kind of a kind of a neat. So they they got it down to a science. And if it didn't work, guess what would have happened? They would have died out. They would have gone extinct. So, so let's talk about the different types of cup, uh, different types of nests. We'll start out with the cup nest. 
uh, made from a variety of coarse materials, ranging from grasses and twigs, mud, saliva. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Soft plant material lines uh, the inside cup of those, uh, of those nests here. And then we have platform nests, so that's cup nests, and we got platform nests, just like you'd think, it's a platform, like a morning dove, they do like a little platform um, <laughs> of doing it here. And then we have pendulous nests, these are, think of it like a sock hanging from a tree, uh, a pendulous nest. These are some of the more, more intricate, uh, elaborate types of nests here. Uh, Orioles uh, are, are known for this type of thing too. So, then we have uh, mud nests, we have adobe style nests like this American Dipper. I find this absolutely fascinating. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll, they'll make this nest of all this uh, uh, mossy material and they build it so close to a waterfall that water splashes on it to keep it moist and keep it alive during the whole time. It's a fascinating stuff that they do here. Uh, and then these mud nests, like for example, um, uh, with the barn swallow, uh, they build up these nests. Uh, who's got this on their house or their barn? Or <laughs> Anybody have this? Yeah, always drives a lot of people crazy. But I, I like having them around because they eat all the bugs. I think it's a, it's a kind of a, you know, when, you're, when they're all done, you can just clean up after them, no big deal. So there's a lot of different stuff here. Cavity nests, wow, who came up with this one, right? What bird finally decided, I am going to take my face and bang holes in trees? You know, it's like, wow, how'd they come up with this? Uh, but that's, that's a very successful strategy for uh, reproduction. Uh, quick fact, birds that nest in cavities are upwards of 60% um, uh, of their young will survive, where other birds not in cavities will be 40 to, uh, uh, 40 to 50%. So they're gaining, gaining anywhere from 10 to 20% increase in the uh, reproduction of their stuff, so. All right, uh, so then we have scrape nests, which are basically just a scrape on the ground uh, here. And then we have, a, a, those are the ground nests, of course, too. And we have mound nests like this. And then, of course, uh, this, <laughs> this is the modern cavity nest, right? <laughs> Wiped out all the cavities, so what do you do? You build boxes for them, all right. So there's some curious nesting behaviors out there, too. So nest building is a strange behavior uh, for an animal that doesn't really have hands, if you think about it. And this is what I like to do. I like to think about all this stuff in ways uh, a, a naturalist would think about things, not in ways that maybe perhaps <coughs> the average person would think about it. And that is the fact that they build all this stuff without hands. They use their bill, their beak. Uh, it's a tool that is um, a multi-use tool. It's the original Swiss Army knife. It does everything. It's really fantastic. So, um, <clears throat> so some species take the wonders of nest construction a few steps further, and um, and can help you identify their the nest. So, when we're on our bluebird trail, we can open it up, and you can tell immediately what species it is just by simply looking at the materials and how it was made, uh, too. So, um, so raptors and uh, wrens can construct extra nests within their uh, territory. Maybe we should talk about that real quick. Um, this is uh, this is my house. This is a this is a old wooden box my dad built back in the '60s. I still have it. I put it out just for them to use, and I take it back in. Um, it's really fun to see. Uh, you know uh, house rings how that works. So the male will uh, he'll find up to three different cavities, and then what will he do? He'll put nesting material like in the first cavity. Then he'll go to the second, you know, cavity or nest box. He'll put in some, you know, you've seen this, right? Little sticks about that long. They got, you know, the thin little things. He'll put in 10, 20 of them. Then he'll go to a third box, you know, and then he'll do a little nest in there. And then what does he do? He jumps up on his perch and he starts to sing. He has to attract in a female. And if he's lucky enough and he attracts in a female, he'll take her to the prospective houses. Honey, what do you think of this one here? And she'll look at it, and she'll go in, and she'll come out, and she'll look at it. And he'll start getting nervous, like, oh my gosh, you know. All right, come on, what do you think of this one right here, you know? And she'll come over, she'll look at it, oh my gosh, this is great, you know. No, nah, but not quite, you know. He's like, got one more for you, right here. And then she'll come over, she'll look, ooh, this one's good, I like this one here. And then she will finish up the nest. She'll bring in those sticks, and she'll build it up inside. You know, you've seen those boxes like this, right? And what do they do? They fill it right up to the top of the sticks, right? There's a little entrance that they can kind of get in there. Then in the far back corner, she builds her little round nest. She lines it with some nice little fine plant materials. Beautiful, you know? And she'll start laying her eggs and things like that. 
And then what does the male do? Of course, he gets back on his perch and he starts singing, come on down, I got two more boxes to go. <laughs> Don't judge him. I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking he's a scoundrel, right? But there's, there's lots of different strategies to, uh, for all this here. Too. So uh, we have interesting things, nesting behaviors like wood ducks, for example, who will build their own nest, right, in a, in a cavity. She'll pluck feathers from her chest. She'll line the nest. She'll lay her eggs in there. But she'll also lay her eggs in other nests, too. This is called egg dumping, where the, she'll go and put eggs in other nests, too. So that kind of it helps out for that, um, that old adage of don't put all your eggs in one basket type of thing, right? Because think about it, in nature, everything boils down to one of two things. It all comes down to either finding food or reproduction, okay? Food and sex. These are the two things I understand the most. This is why I'm a naturalist, okay? And so that's what these things are. And so they're trying to lay their eggs in other uh, uh, nests so that it diversifies and increases their chances of their young surviving, passing on their genes. And it's really interesting. There's so many cases of two females in the same nest. There's um, cases where, of course, uh, hooded mergansers will lay their eggs in these nests, or common golden eyes will also. So you can have upwards of three different species being incubated by one adult wood duck. All of a sudden, nesting is interesting now, isn't it? You know? So there's lots of cool things going on. Um, and nest building takes a lot of energy, of course. You know, they're investing in trying to get that reproduction going. Um, I find this fascinating too. American Red Star, here, this, I was filming this American Red Star uh, near my house, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. The female comes in, she's starting to feed, and then she leaves, and then the female came in, and she starts feeding, and then she leaves, and this keeps going. I'm sitting there thinking, what the hell is this male? And then all of a sudden, they both landed, and they're, do you guys know American Red Starts? you know this bird? The male is all black with a little orange on them. Striking bird, right? <laughs> you got two birds like this. I'm thinking, well, I'm a modern guy, okay, two females, but how did they pull that off? I mean, how did they get the reproduction going part of it? And then, of course, the answer is, is that first-year male American Red Starts don't have the breeding plumage yet, and sometimes they nest. So it was actually a male who, do you see this little black right there? That's the dead giveaway right there. That means he's about to change colors into that all-black plumage with the orange on it. So a lot of things going on at the nest. A lot of things happening there too. So, uh, cavity nests are often used more than once, which is uh, good because they're really labor intensive to be able to construct them. So, primary cavity nesters, such as woodpeckers, construct these these homes, and then uh, secondary cavity nesters like bluebirds will then use them after that. Because rarely do woodpeckers go back and reuse that same cavity, with the exception of flickers and a few of the uh, sap suckers. All right. So you get uh, things like this, where eastern bluebirds can come in and get the and uh, use those cavities too. So, um, and then you have takeover opportunities. So we have all those different types of nests, and then we have those who don't build a nest at all, like great horned owls. They simply take over. They're the bullies, right? They simply take over any nest. And uh, so this here is a great uh, blue heron nest, and the uh, 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 great horned owls just came in and said, "Nope, mine. Take it." or they'll take a crow nest, or a red-tailed hawk, and they tend to nest before the other species do. So oftentimes you can get it where um, the great horned owls will fledge, and then shortly after that, the great blue herons will come in and they'll use the nest. So it all works out uh, very fine. So by the way, a little personal note, a year ago, um, I have 30 acres on, an, on a lake. I built a platform um, for great horned owls to nest on, and I have a tree trimming company that was doing some work for me. I said, hey, can you put this platform up in the tree for me? And they're like, oh, yeah, no problem. So they put it up there. And uh, about five days before coming down here, I looked up on the platform, and what did I see? A pair of ears. Great horn owls. She's, she's incubating on the nest. You provide it, they'll be going to use it. So kind of a neat thing. But other birds um, will take over other nests, like red-tailed hawks, American crows. Great crested flycatchers all will take over other nests and they don't build their own nests too. And then there's nest parasitism. Oh my gosh. Does it get more complicated? 
a nest parasitism, brown-headed cowbirds, of course. You, you guys know the story about brown-headed cowbirds, right? No? I'm seeing, oh, okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, brown-headed cowbirds, uh, we have uh, three species of birds that are parasitist, parasitistic birds in uh, North America. And uh, the brown-headed cowbird, the female goes out to find the nests of other birds and then lays her eggs in other birds' nests. So she never builds a nest, she never incubates, and it sounds like a slacker to me, but, um, and then lets other parents raise their young, and then when those baby brown-haired cowbirds get back enough, uh, it's, you know, mature enough, they'll come back to the flock, and come back to the species. Now, let's set this aside, set aside for the moment that I really think that this is a genius. <laughs> this is brilliant, you know? Somebody else raises your kids, and then when they get to the fun stage, then they come back to you. You know, I, I like that, you know? <laughs> you know? But here's a good example of it here. This is Eastern Phoebe eggs, and these are brown-headed cowbird eggs. When you see this, what do you, what do you see immediately when you look at this photo right there? Anything, anything jump out at you? Let me get some of the drinks so quick. Nothing jump out at you? Bigger, ooh, good job, who said bigger? Good job, bigger. The bigger the egg, the more mass. The more mass, the more heat it attracts. The more heat it attracts, it incubates faster. And guess what? These guys will hatch before them. Then, how they do this, still unknown. You've got a baby brown-headed cowbird who's Blind, meaning their eyes are still sealed shut. They're naked, they have a few little feathers on them, that's about it, and basically helpless, push the other eggs in the nest out. How does it even know what's around them? How does he know there's other eggs there? I mean, this is stuff that we just don't know. There's so much in nature we just don't know about. Uh, and it almost always results in the parents raising um, baby brown head cowbirds like this here. This is a chipping sparrow and that's a brown-headed cowbird. Um, and you know, when I, as a naturalist, look at this, I wanna know immediately, how the heck does this brown-headed cowbird not grow up to think it's a chipping sparrow? It's a legitimate question, right? How does it, more importantly, how does it sing the right song? Because all the studies show you that most of the songs they learn by listening to their parents. So how does the brown-headed cowbird not grow up to sound like a chipping sparrow. It's really crazy stuff. So I could really get into all that. You know what? I have another talk that kind of looks at the uncommon facts of birds. Have me back. We'll do that uncommon fact talk. <laughs> it is so much fun. We have so many things to talk about in that one. But anyway, so uh, regardless of weather changes, uh, birds don't try to build a different kind of nest to suit different things. They stick with the same kind of nest, same kind of materials, the same you know, basic construction, so on and so forth. Um, and so the construction crew here, um, here's a good uh, general rule. If the male and the female look similar to each other, they split their duties about 50-50. So uh, it, everything from nest building to incubating to feeding and things like that. In the species where the male and the female, where they're sexually dimorphic, meaning they look different from each other, uh, then typically the female does most of the work on there. So that's kind of a general rule you can you can kind of look at. So great blue herons, for example, the males and females look exactly the same, right? And so they tend to split everything up about the same. Too. So now the avian toolkit, which is basically um, the bill of these birds, it's really a multi-tool that serves as a drill, a needle, a trowel, a forceps, tweezers, everything you could possibly imagine to do to build that nest. I mean, would you look at that? That is really truly amazing stuff. I mean, that it's just an American, it's just a robin nest, but it's still amazing. It still looks amazing too. So they're master weavers, of course, and uh, there's all sorts of things. Oh, April. Excuse me. Hit um, play, or not play, just get on the screen and, and click the left click. <coughs> So this is an Oriole, Baltimore, this is my yard, and so look at this, look at that. This is purposeful weaving of, look at that. There is no, oh, well, I think I'll just throw some stuff up here and see what happens, you know. 
This is really specific tying knots, weaving it all in there. This is really, truly amazing stuff. Uh, I just thought it would be fun to show you that. To show, <clears throat> they start out with just a few little things here and then they build this whole pendulous style nest like that. Truly remarkable stuff. And they're doing it out of strips of bark off of different, uh, like grapevine and you know different plant materials like that. Truly remarkable stuff. But, and then we can talk about <clears throat> Some crazy nesting strategies like the kitty wakes on their on the walls of uh, of uh, rocks outcroppings over water and just all sorts of crazy stuff like that or a warbler like the Kirkland's warbler who nests on the ground who came up with that idea of coming up nesting on the ground you know it's a terrible uh, idea to do so and then um, of course we have uh, eggs which are an intricate part of our nests of course completes the lifestyle package, and um, uh, I think, is this something we do or don't know? I don't know, but all birds can only lay one egg a day. So if you've ever raised chickens, you know this, right? Your chickens only lay one egg a day, and sometimes it's two days in between, or three days in between, so. So, and then the egg is truly a remarkable thing because it contains everything, the nutrients, the fats, the water, you know, um, the productive uh, membrane, everything's there to help support that young uh, bird as it's, as it's growing. And then the shapes of those eggs are very different too, depending on where they're at. So when you talk about things like, here, I'll just pop this up here. When you talk about the types of eggs, like the thick-billed myrrh has these big uh, piloform shaped eggs so that when the egg rolls away, it rolls in circles. It doesn't roll off. Like, a, like the great horned owl, which has got more of a circular or round nest, round egg, and <clears throat> they typically nest in things like this and um, they're usually fairly well protected, so an egg that kind of rolls around a little bit doesn't you know, uh, have any dangers of falling off a cliff like your thick bill myrrh, which you know, one little bad roll and say goodbye to the egg. You know? Or parity falcon, same thing. Too. Or excuse me, uh, parity falcon too. So pigments and patterns I find absolutely fascinating. So one of the things, um, <clears throat> you know, studying uh, uh, avian ecology is looking at the reproductive system of these birds and how it passes, how the egg passes through the reproductive tract of a, of a female bird. And when it gets to the end, the, so it, you know it starts at the you know starts right at the embryo and then adds in the yolk and kind of keeps building up from the inside out how these eggs are made. And then the very last thing that happens is the pigments that get put onto these eggs as they exit the uh, female bird's body. So some really amazing stuff going on in our nesting there too. So, uh, and of course, producing an egg takes about 24 hours. So from the time of uh, fertilization, from the sperm and the egg are joined, then 24 hours it passes through the reproductive tract of the, of the bird and out pops an egg. Hence, one egg a day, right? So uh, uh, egg laying lasts just a few seconds to about an hour. Um, at my nature center, we raise chickens. And one year, I raised a chicken, hatched her by, you know, by herself. She bonded to me and then proceeded to live in my nature center for the next seven and a half years. And she would lay eggs all the time, so she'd be outside doing her thing. And then when she had to lay an egg, she'd come running back to the nature center, banging on the door with her feet, you know, let me in, let me in. We'd let her in, she'd come running in and lay her egg in the thing. And oftentimes it would take just 10 seconds or so, and then she was off again to go in. Amazing stuff. So uh, the number of eggs in a clutch um, varies amongst the birds and the ages. So the older the female, the less. Maybe I shouldn't go there. Um, and, uh, anyhow, so lots of different things. How are we doing on time, folks? Huh? We doing all right? F Fifteen minutes? Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> so generally, species with a widespread range have more clutches with fewer eggs per season in the southern states than in the northern locations. So in one experiment, a northern flicker laid over 70 eggs, as many uh, uh, when the scientists removed. So this was an experiment where they <clears throat> try to see there's determinate layers and indeterminate layers. I'm not gonna get into this because it's a little complicated, but like sandhill cranes, how many eggs? Period, it's two eggs. Hummingbirds, how many eggs? Two, period, right? There's some species, California condor, one egg, done. <laughs> Other species will have like four or five, and then they're done. But other species like a flicker, they're trying to achieve a certain amount, and as they're trying to reach like six or seven, 
But when the researchers keep removing the eggs from the nest, she responds by you know, just keep trying to replace, trying to replace, trying to replace all the time. Which is mind blowing because last time I checked, uh, birds couldn't count. But you know, so there's a lot of unknowns in this in this, uh, this stuff here. So incubation duties are very interesting. All birds, when they're incubating their eggs, have to get uh, their eggs up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Average body core temperature of, of most of our birds runs 105 to 106 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And then they have to heat up those eggs. And it's like, well, you think about, well, well, they sit on it. They just sit on the eggs, right? Well, that'll warm them up. Well, only a certain amount. Because what is between the heat source inside the bird and the eggs, but the right. most, the feathers, the most insulated quality product on the planet? How do you get that feather, how do you get that heat from your internal body to your eggs? And you do that with a brood patch. And that's what this is here. So these birds, in a lot of species, the female will pluck feathers to be able to have a almost, in some species like bluebirds, for example, she'll have a bare skin patch, pink skin that is in direct contact with her eggs. Other species like this one here will have a few different feathers in them. And then they're able to get that heat to the eggs because this is very important. Um, incubating eggs, has anybody ever incubated eggs? So we do this at the Nature Center all the time. We've got these complicated incubators. They got humidifiers in them. We got temperature, you know, thermometers, you know, these, uh, uh, we measure the humidity in there. All this stuff, it's still, we're only getting like 40 or 60% of our eggs hatching. And I sit there and I think, how the heck do these birds do this? They're out there in the wind and the rain and all those things, and yet they get 100% egg hatching. It's really crazy stuff. And here we struggle with all this technology. But it's fun to see this. So in some species, the male and the female have brood patches. In some species, only the female has it. And in a few selected, like the phalaropes, only the male has it. So there are different species that do it. So for example, bald eagles, are you guys, are, is anybody here one of those bald eagle cam watchers? You know, you know what I'm talking about? They got those nest cams where they watch the eagles. And the female does most of the incubating, right? But now and then, you know, a couple times a day, she's gotta get up, she's gotta go stretch, she has to fly, she has to defecate, get some food, whatever. And the male will come over. Well, the male is simply just preserving the heat that the female has already provided in those situations. So there's lots going on. And so now all of a sudden, aren't you seeing that nesting is really kind of a fairly complicated thing. So that, well, we talked about this 100 degrees uh, patch, blah, 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 okay, all right. So interesting things about that too. And then when the, when the bird hatches, when the babies hatch, how do you get out of the inside of an egg? Okay, you're inside of the egg, right? Yeah. And you grow up so big that you're like crammed in there. You know, sometimes your chin is down here, you know, you just get this shell. Oh, I'm claustrophobic just thinking about that. Yeah. And you got this egg, which is really hard and strong. And how do they get out? But they use an egg tube. Here's a good example of it right there. See this, that piece right there? That's the egg tube where the baby bird, and all the baby birds have this, otherwise they never get to be able to get out of their eggs. They're, they push that egg tooth against the egg shell, and then they'll still try to spin inside of their egg, sketching or etching the inside of the egg all around. And they keep doing this, spinning around and around until you get a weak spot. Whoops, here, back up one here. Oh, I missed it. And it'll crack open the egg and the top comes off it and the baby is able to come out. So some really fascinating stuff with, with that. And within 24 hours of, um, of this, the egg tooth either, in some species it drops off, other species it's reabsorbed into the bill, things like that. So pretty interesting stuff once they're, once they're hatched. And then we've got things like uh, parents removing fecal sacs from the nest. So you got a cavity nest, you got nowhere, you have no bathroom, right? So what do you do? You got babies who produce their, their feces in a clear membrane sack that the parents have to carry away. So here it is, right there. So the you know, they go in, they feed their babies, the babies, you know, mouth open, uh, you know, they feed them, and then what does the baby do? Turns around and, 
and <clears throat> adult grabs it, and they fly off, and then they drop it away from the nest. One, keeps the nest clean. Two, doesn't attract other you know, predators. And it's just a general hygiene type of thing. So, so they do all that, so a lot of different stuff. And then some species will read, some of the, the adults will re-ingest that um, uh, fecal sac too, and uh, they'll gain as much as 10% of uh, the nutrients, uh, their daily uh, nutrients from their baby's poop. You thought you had it hard. Either, <laughs> and, uh, man, sometimes it's crazy. So well, here you can see how the hatching works here too. So, all right. Uh, what else we got? Oh, April. Hit it again. So this is a good example of it. This is white breasted nuthatch coming in. See, comes in with food, feeds, <coughs> grabs the fecal sac, and off she goes. Fun stuff. So, all right. So, uh, backyard birds. The number of nests in your yard depends on the quality of your habitat, of course, the amount of food that you have, so on and so forth. Uh, a perfect imitation. April, one more time. So here's a female cardinal coming in, gonna feed her babies. She's got this, and the babies are like, oh, mom, green worms again. <laughs> so she feeds, and she's trying to, you know, some goes to one, some goes to the other. I, and I cut this film a little short for obvious reasons, because it's just it's a little rude. But so, and then watch this, right down there. Here comes the butt, that's the fecal sac coming out. Then the parent takes the fecal sac and flies off with the kid. So, <clears throat> Anyhow, warblers make their own types of nests. It's usually a cup nest, very fine uh, material, very nice. So um, constructing nests on horizontal branches. Uh, they use twigs, they use all sorts of different things too. So uh, I'm gonna kind of rip through this here because we want to have a few minutes for questions and answers, right? Um, so, uh, so seven to 15 days to build a nest, a pendulous nest like that, you use just about anything that they can find, i.e. little pieces of plastic in there too. So, and then we have nest box success. So we, as we know, uh, in the early 1900s, we were busy clearing the land to uh, feed a growing nation, and we took down all the dead trees. A lot of people were using firewood to heat their homes, and of course we wiped out most of the cavities, and we had problems with um, bluebirds uh, going away, both eastern and western and mountain. And, um, and so it, it really uh, is a, uh, it's now a success story in that uh, we got to all time low numbers. Uh, some people like to equate the decline of the bluebird with the invention of the gas powered chainsaw because so, certainly, uh, suddenly we became uh, the really efficient at taking down trees trees we didn't even need to take down, we could now take down, and, uh, and we see the precipitous decline of things like the bluebirds, and then of course, then when we, the environmental movement started in the 1970s, and then people started building boxes to replace those missing cavities, and now we've got this network of bluebird boxes all over, all over the United States, and we've got a great success story of these birds coming back dramatically right now, so. Um, all right, uh, I had no idea what to talk about there, so let's move on. Um, owls, owls and cavities, I find that fascinating, like barn owls here, which find natural cavities and then uh, build their uh, nests in there. Elf owls, of course, are the, the smallest owl uh, in the world, and they are in cavities uh, also. Kestrels, which are fun, they're in a cavity too, which is a fun little uh, uh, thing to see. Merlins, anybody know the difference between, yeah, how, nobody knows about merlins? Let's move on. They're the same exact size, it's just the kestrels, the American kestrel is more colorful, the merlin is not, and the merlin has a platform nest, um, and these guys are cavity nests. There's very big, big differences between them too. So, uh, Cooper's hawks, of course, um, will reuse their nest for almost up to 10 years, and uh, broad-winged hawks are well-known for the aggressively defending their uh, thing. <laughs> a quick funny story about broad -wing. So uh, the nature center uh, that I uh, direct is run by a city, and um, so uh, one day the police department calls me out and they said, Stan, we've got this uh, problem with a broadwing hawk or with a hawk. Can you go over to these neighbors and meet the officer at this place? So I did, went over there. And of course what did happen was uh, the neighbors, it's so funny, it's a blue sky, beautiful day. I pull up and there's people wearing hard hats, umbrellas, 
and they're all walking around their neighborhood gardening and things like that. And I'm thinking, oh, that's a weird sight. And in fact, what was happening was they had a broad winged hawk that was coming down and kind of hitting people. And um, I thought that was great. So. Uh, hit this one, April. Uh oh. I'm, she's got the hook. She's about to get rid, get rid of me. So here's a Cooper's hawk coming in. She calls, 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 and she's got food down here. <coughs> And she's going to start feeding. I love this with a little runt right up front there, too. Yeah, but remember, they're eating another bird. It's a birdie bird world out there. I'm telling you. All right, we got to go on because she's going to get thrown, out of, you know, get thrown off the stage here. <laughs> I have no idea what to talk about with game birds, and other than they're very cute when they're young. Uh, sage grouse, all of these birds are elaborate dancers, performers. For, uh, for uh, mating rights, of course, for American woodcock that's dancing on the ground. All right, what do we got here? She good? All right, one. Oh, so with that, because she's about to throw me off the stage here. I know, so. I knew there was a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so with that, I'd be happy to might have about bird nests or birds in general or things like that. Yes, go ahead. Could you talk a little bit more Oh, so we just found that using vanilla helps to reduce the amount of, uh, she wants to know about vanilla in our, in our bluebird boxes. Uh, so, all right, what you all learned that about if, you know, human scent is on a nest or an egg or a baby that the parents will reject it, eh, false. It's not true at all. So we take out our nest, we clean out the whole box, spray a little vanilla, put the nest back in, close it back up, and, and it gets rid of all the bugs. We have zero problem with bugs now, and it uh, works really well um, for it. And the parents, just they're right back in feeding. If you know anything about avian ecology, you know what birds, most birds have a very reduced ability to smell. So the whole notion of, um, and a lot of the things that we all learned as kids, it turns out to be false, and we're learning a lot now, so. And, and that's just one of them. So, so you could use it on any brand of type of bird, not just blueberry. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So right behind the curve. Go ahead. Thank you for a, a fascinating lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it, what is, if anything, is known about how brain function would pre-program uh, sequential behavior, such as nest building, such as, uh, you know, so how is weather affected, you're saying? I'm sorry? How weather affects it? No, no. It's what is known about the physiology of how the brain accepts the brain. a program, like you program a computer to do a series okay. of steps. <clears throat> okay, gotcha. So that is a, it, it's an interesting thing. So um, it used to be believed that we thought, just like, you think, like you're saying, that there was a pre-programmed steps within the bird to do certain behaviors to achieve a certain goal. And what we've learned since then is that that is not true. Um, they have, um, each bird has its own set of experiences, its own um, kind of likes and dislikes and abilities and disabilities. And the ones that survive are the ones that pass on their genes and are get better and get better and get better at it. So um, it was it used to be taught that way. We used to, uh, that was what we learned about uh, a bird behavior, animal behavior, that they were basically automatons, that you wound them up and they just did the same exact behavior over and over again. And in fact, that's just not true. Uh, and we see that time and time again. So uh, we've got an owl at my nature center, uh, you know, uh, an uh, educational ambassador. You know, he's injured, can't go release to the wild. And just watching that bird's behaviors and how it sees and assesses each situation differently, recognizes each individual people all differently and reacts to them differently too. So really all the stuff that we used to learn turns out to be really not true and that we're, we're seeing that there's a lot of variations in all of this. Now hopefully that got close to your answer that you were looking for. Bert, the, the cavity nest or so not to have pigments in their eggs that uh, open the nest or so? All right, so his question is, cavity nests tend to not have pigment in their eggs, where open cup nesters oftentimes do. And that's very true. So if you're inside of a cavity, um, then uh, there's no light. It's dark. And so why try to camouflage your eggs? 
Whereas if you're out in the open, you're gonna try to camouflage your eggs too. So there's a, those evolutionary things happen over millions of years. The successful ones then go on to reproduce and that trait, whatever it was, that variation that they had, carries on. The things that don't work, don't carry on and die out. So and we get to this point where we've got birds doing these behaviors now and, and having eggs looking certain ways, nesting in different spots, so on and so forth. Make sense? Yes, go ahead. Yes. So the first question was the saliva. Um, basically what it is is like uh, chimney swifts. We have chimney swifts nesting at my nature center and they build a nest by taking their saliva, which acts like a glue, and they take sticks and they put it together and they put saliva on there and they, they glue it all together. It's absolutely fascinating. I've got, I, take a, I take one of my cameras, I put it on a pole and I put it down the chimney and I can get right down to it and take pictures of it. It's fascinating to see how they do this. Has anybody traveled to Asia? And, and you ever eaten bird nest soup? Bird nest soup is basically it. It's a type of swift where they only use saliva to build their nest, no sticks. So they're using their saliva only to build it. They collect those nests and they boil those down. And so you're, it, it shouldn't be called bird nest soup. It should be called bird spit soup. <laughs> uh, and then what was, what was the second question? Just the bluebirds that died in the Oh. Yeah, uh, last uh, spring, a year ago, we had that big frost, you know, remember Texas and the electrical grid and all that stuff? So many bluebirds died and we were heavily impacted. So the first nesting cycle we had on bluebirds, um, we were a little bit below 50% of our reproductive uh, normal. And then by, but by the end of summer, we kind of caught up. So it'll be really interesting to see this spring's nesting if it picks up. I've got 30 boxes at my property and I had only one pair last year. Awful, just awful. Yeah, you guys, same thing, zero? I know, it's really a bad year. And it was everywhere, not just you know, certain places. Is she standing over there? I am, I'm getting the time. <laughs> There's always gonna be more questions, and I think it's like Stan said, there's always something to learn. And what we've learned years and years ago is now we're finding might not always be exactly accurate or not accurate at all because we're getting more things, we're watching more, we're having more people. And, and just like with, with Stan and his work, there's no one person, one organization, one group who can do it all. It takes everybody doing their part. And thank you, Stan, for what you're doing, getting people excited and interested uh, here through your books and, and all that you do on the radio and everything else, but also in your nature center. And we're glad you chose to be a naturalist and not a naturist. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, but thank you to Stan and thank you all of you. He will be back in the back to sign books. And again, thank you, thank you to our sponsors, the Denny and Kyle Foundation, Vortex Optics, and a fellow Minnesotan. So thank you very much. Thanks for caring and thanks for being a part of the Ding family.